All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and get started today. Thank you very much for signing in and joining us for Advanta's educational webinar today. The topic we're going to cover is the basics of syndication investing. My name is Corey Dayharsh, and I am joined today by return guests of Park Capital Partners, Mr. Richard Coyne and Bill Zaylor. Uh, I've been in connection with these guys since moving up to Western North Carolina. They are expert syndicators and educators. They both participate in the local RIA group, as well as their own multifamily educational group that they run monthly. Richard, uh, feel free to introduce yourself and thank you again for joining again. Thank you, Corey. Hey, folks, uh, certainly glad to be here. Appreciate your time and, and taking uh, some, some part of your day to, to be on this educational webinar. Certainly glad to be here. Uh, Bill's traveling. He's not able to be on, but uh, but again, that's what uh, Bill and I look like. And again, certainly glad to be here. Thank you for inviting us, Corey, and uh, I'll hand back to you. And, and when you're ready, I'll, I'll take over. Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much. I will let you know. I'll get through a few slides here uh, with some information about Advanta, information about syndication investing, a quick case study, how an investor can use a self-direct account for a syndication. And then I'll hand it over to Richard for his presentation. Uh, he's going to cover from the syndicator side uh, what you might want to look for as you're investing, what he looks for as a syndicator, and then a, a case study himself on a recent deal that they've gotten accomplished. So uh, again, I've had Richard and Bill on before. They are expert educators. I really, really appreciate the information and knowledge they bring to the investor community. And I hope you as the participants here will uh, glean some information from that as well. So Advanta IRA is a self-directed IRA administrator. We've been in business just about 20 years. We've got about 8,000 active clients with just over 2 billion in assets under management. And aside from the educational components that we provide, the other thing that we try to do that stands us out from our other competitors in this industry is a dedicated client account manager paired with each client of ours so that you don't have to deal with a call center. You have one point of contact that you reach out to whenever you have questions about your retirement account investing or any other specific investments that you'd like to get accomplished. If you've not heard about self-directed investing, that is pretty common. Only about 4% of retirement accounts in the US are self-directed accounts. Uh, so typically your larger wirehouse IRAs, like your Edward Jones, your T. Rowe Price, they allow you to invest into specific assets that they've vetted out and done due diligence on, where a truly self-directed IRA custodian will allow you to invest into anything as long as it's not a life insurance policy or what the IRS would deem to be a hard to value collectible. So not knowing about self-direction is pretty common. I'm glad you're here learning more and how it may fit into your investing or retirement planning goals. Again, a self-directed IRA lets you to invest into anything you'd like. It could be real estate. It could be syndications like we're going to talk about today, even hard money lending precious metals, foreign currency, futures trading, cryptocurrency, and much more. Feel free to reach us if you have any specific questions about investments you'd like to hold with your IRA or 401k, and we'll be happy to work through that strategy with you. Now, when I say self-directed IRA, I am not limiting to specific IRA accounts. While we do hold Roth and traditional IRAs, we also allow for SEP and simple IRAs, solo 401k plans, health savings and education savings accounts. So you can really move any type of retirement plan you have in the US to a self-directed capacity. One of the great things is that if you've got a previous employer plan, like a 403B, a 401k, 457, or even a TSP plan, if you used to be active with the military and have left the service, those are all types of accounts that you can very easily, without taxable consequence, roll over to a self-direct plan and start investing as you see fit. And again, it's a great source of new capital to that effect. So jumping right into this next slide, why do people choose to self-direct? One of the main reasons is they find it to be a new source of capital. So investors can actually tap into their retirement account and continue doing investments that they've already been doing with a new source of money. 
you may be tired of the stock market fluctuation and looking for something that you have a a little more control of and b a little bit higher average rate of returns with the investments you're making as opposed to the stock market fluctuating and third the tax benefits any investments you make with a self-directed account are either going to have your earnings grow tax deferred meaning you pay taxes on the money when you distribute it later on in life or completely tax-free if you've already paid taxes on that retirement account and transitioned it to a Roth or a post-tax status account. Now, why are IRAs and 401ks a good source of capital? Speaking specifically on syndication investing, if you're going to repeat investments, it's very easy to redeploy funds. So if you're working with a syndicator and your funds come back or your deal is done and they've got another offering ready, it's very simple and easy to just roll that money right into your next deal. If you're not expecting to use that money anytime soon, in other words, retire and take distributions, it is a great way to put your money to work where you don't need to necessarily worry about taking out of your savings account and having that money parked and unaccessible for a five to 10 year time frame. This is retirement money that you probably weren't going to touch anyway for the next five to 10 years due to it being your retirement savings. As I mentioned a few slides back, you likely can get better returns on your self-directed investments than the tumultuous stock market or any other types of offerings that your bank has like money market or CDs or, or bonds and things like that. And the final thing that makes an IRA or a 401k a great source for syndication investing is that there is no outside approval needed. You are the self-direct account holder and you make those directives for your account. We are here to answer any questions you have and help complete your investment transaction within IRS protocol, but it is ultimately up to you to conduct all due diligence on your investments and make those investments as you see fit. We will help you do that and make it very smooth and simple for your side of the table. So the key takeaway points I'd like everyone to walk away from this webinar with is that syndication investing as a limited partner offers you completely passive income, in other words, mailbox money. You apply the money into the deal and then sit back and wait for your returns to come back into your retirement account. It's important, as I just mentioned on the last slide, that you conduct all of your due diligence thoroughly. You are ultimately in control of your self-directed account, so all the investments you make are completely at your discretion and you should make sure that you've done all the due diligence necessary to feel comfortable that that investment's gonna work out in your favor. And the third takeaway point is when you're investing through a self-direct account, your retirement account is the investor, not yourself as an individual. So all of the investment paperwork will be filled out in the name of your retirement account and tied through to the retirement account's tax ID number. In this case, it's likely Advantage Trust tax ID number that we'll be using for the investment. But the main point is that it's not your social security number and you will not have any taxable liability or consequence for your retirement account investments. When you're looking for deals, which is part of what we're going to talk about today, it is important that you invest with people you know. So use your network, leverage the people you've met through investing or through other resources and, and ways of life to find out about new deals and do your due diligence. Uh, in today's case, I mean, I met Richard and Bill when I moved up to Asheville through the local RIA group and then through their own subgroup that they run on multifamily investing. And it's been a great resource for me. There are other groups that you can find in your area like your local RIA or other investor groups you might look for on Meetup and use that network to grow and expand what you're able to invest into, who you have as a resource for your due diligence and anything further that could help your investment journey. Now, a quick disclaimer before I go into my case study and hand over to Richard, Advanta and its employees do not provide any investment advice or endorse any specific products or offerings. All of the information and material you will see today and have seen up to this point is for educational purposes. And we always encourage you to consult your own CPA, accountants, attorneys, financial advisors before entering any investment. So, Again, conduct your due diligence thoroughly and fairly. 
Now, a quick case study before I hand off to Richard, how do you use a retirement account to invest into a syndication? So I've got a scenario here with Joseph, an investor, and Malik, a syndicator. Joseph has over 50,000 in an IRA with a larger custodian, and he meets Malik, who is a syndicator with an offering for a local apartment building. Malik provides Joseph the subscription documents, and he reviews, does his due diligence, determines the minimum investment is 50,000, and he'd like to move forward making that investment. Joseph opens up his self-direct account, at Advanta and completes a transfer request form so that we reach out to Charles Schwab and initiate the transfer of those funds. Once the funds arrive, we notify Joseph and we also put that client account manager I referenced earlier in direct contact with Malik to get the investment paperwork in order and underway. Joseph's account manager coordinates with Joseph and Malik to complete the documents in the name of the IRA. An example there is Advanta IRA for the benefit of Joseph with his account number tied to it as well. The tax ID number as I referenced would be the Advanta Trust Tax ID, not Joseph Social. And Joseph will have to mark all of the investment paperwork as read and approved before Advanta moves forward and executes the transaction and sends out any funds. In this case, the way the deal works out is that Malik's partnership pays an 8% preferred distribution annually to all subscribers. And in year five, the project's refinanced and Joseph receives a lump sum payout of 65,000. So over that time frame, I see there's a missed name there, Abel is supposed to be Joseph. Uh, the retirement account has earned 20,000 in yearly preferred distributions, as well as a $15,000 chunk of profit at the end. Now, as I alluded to earlier, that total amount of money is created either tax-free or tax-deferred, depending on the status of Joseph's retirement account. So no capital gains, no additional taxes that have to be paid, that is all investment money that has been earned through a tax sheltered retirement investing account. So it's important to realize when you're talking about self-directed investing, what type of investor are you? If you're looking to do active investments like rentals, rehabs, or wholesaling, there is pros that you have additional control and decision making, but it is also more timely, more expensive, and more responsibility on you to provide details about those investments if you're trying to do those things through a self-direct account, which ultimately is supposed to be generating passive income. If you are a passive investor, then the types of investments that work for you are likely private placements, syndications like we're talking about today, and other private lending opportunities. The benefits there is there's no time commitment, there's no bother with the minutia of the details, and it is mailbox money, money you're receiving after the proceeds of the investment or during the investments uh, timeline where any distributions are made. It's all just coming back into the retirement account without you having to do any legwork. And the cons, if you consider them cons, are that you don't have as much control into what's taking place and you don't have any day-to-day -day decision-making responsibilities. You are simply a limited partner or a lender in those scenarios. But again, it's a great way to put your retirement account to work for you and not have to go out and actually work a day job. It's all meant to grow your retirement living and earnings. It's real quick and easy to get started with a self-direct account. It only takes about 15 minutes to complete our account application. You can complete that digitally via DocuSign. Just reach out and I can send you a link. Again, we pair each client with a dedicated client account manager that's there to guide you through every step of the way. I served in that role for five years. We end up getting to know our clients on a very, very close basis so that we're able to help and know pretty much what questions you're gonna ask before you even ask them. It's easy to fund your account. As I mentioned earlier, you can make your contributions, you can transfer from a previous retirement account, or you can do a rollover from a previous employer's plan as well. And once your account's open and it's funded, it's real quick to start investing, find the investment you want, let your account manager know what it is, and we'll help you structure and get that set up and funded as quickly as possible. Advanta offers a lot of educational content. We put on events and webinars like you're seeing today. 
We have a robust video library on YouTube. If you are not able to attend this webinar live and are interested in finding the content or other content that we've put out with any other topics or guest speakers that we've had on. And we also have a blog if you're looking for industry specific news for the retirement account industry, please feel free to check out our blog found at our website. And one final item I'd like to bring to everyone's attention is we have a bi-weekly investor and investment provider networking forum where you as an investor or a investment provider can basically give an elevator speech to the whole group on Zoom and let it be known whatever you're looking for, whatever you have to offer, network from there, conduct your due diligence and see if you can't make a deal with one of our other participants. This is every other Friday. We just did it last Friday, the 22nd. So not this week, but next week will be the next iteration of Pitch Promote Prosper. You can register at our website in the events tab from there. Now I'm about to hand back off to Richard so that he can present his information and education. Before I do so, I wanna give everyone a heads up. Please feel free to throw any questions you have in the question block in GoToWebinar. I will ask Richard questions that you provide throughout the webinar, and we'll also have a full Q&A session available at the end before I close the webinar out completely. So I just wanted to let you know, if you haven't yet, go ahead and find that question block and go ahead and jot down any questions you have for Richard or I, and we will answer them accordingly. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and switch over and provide Richard the presenter role and let him take it away. Thank you, Corey. Let me get this up into presentation mode. Come on. There we While go. you're pulling that up, I see a question. Source of funding is only from rollovers and not a current group plan. Uh, for that individual, it is likely that your current group plan will not allow for a third party administrated leg of the account. There are certain stipulations where a current employer will allow it if you've either got tenure with that company or you've reached a certain age, typically over age 50. That is something you want to ask your benefits department or your HR department to see if you are allowed to roll over for self-direction while you're still employed. But it's likely in most cases that is not an option. You've got to wait until you're done being employed with that company to roll over to a self-directed account. Sorry about that, Richard. I see you're in full screen mode. Go ahead and take it away. Good deal. Hey, Corey, I think that's also known as uh, in service distribution, something like that. Is it right? Correct. Yeah, like an in service. I just had a conversation with an individual yesterday to that effect. Uh, what could be allowed is, is a third party administered leg of your plan with that current employer. It's a case by case basis, depending on the way that plan is set up and that employer structures their retirement offerings. Right. Good deal. Okay, folks, uh, again, thank you for attending. Richard Coyne here. Uh, as Corey said, uh, pop your, your questions in the chat box as we're going. Uh, and again, Corey, jump in anytime you see a question that uh, makes sense to ask, and I'll, I'll happy to happy to address it best I can. Okay, let's go ahead and get going. All right, first of all, I want to introduce uh, who Park Capital Partners is. Again, this is who we're presenting. I'm Richard Coyne. Uh, my business partner, Bill, is not able to be on today. He's traveling. And what we do, we do education. Uh, we run two monthly meetings, as Corey mentioned. Um, one of them is a local RIA meeting where you have to be a member, but we do that both in person and in a hybrid mode where we present on Zoom. And then the other meeting is something on meetup.com, uh, again, presented in person and hybrid. That's called the Asheville Multifamily Investor Club. And wonderful thing about uh, Zoom, because of COVID teaching us that, I guess, is that uh, you can be anywhere and, and connect in. Uh, happy to have you join, and, and uh, again, we'll give you our contact information at the end. Uh, also, we host a podcast. We have a podcast called The Road Less Traveled Show. We just released our 58th episode this morning, uh, released every week. And we also uh, you know, certainly present at events like this one. We're happy to do so anytime. Uh, and you know, if somehow you want to have a group of your friends, have a one-off, let me know. Love to. So what we do, our main business is syndication. We find off and on market apartment complexes that are profitable today and they can be more profitable tomorrow 
uh, we run what's called a value add strategy, whereby we increase the net operating income, the NOI, that's the lifeblood of an apartment complex on a commercial property. What's the net operating income, the NOI? And by doing, by increasing that NOI, we make uh, the property more valuable and therefore we uh, provide returns to pay to the investors. We also give back. Uh, again, we educate, we syndicate, and we give back. We created the Park Capital Partners Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And Bill and I, through Park Capital Partners, fund the operation of the, of the foundation. So no overhead is paid by the foundation. We also give to the foundation from a portion of our profits. Or we give personally to the foundation. And then when an investor invests with us, we make a donation to honor that investor to a charity of their choice from a list of 15. So something we're very proud of and a lot of our investors are excited about that. Our track record since 2018, we've done over $150 million in real estate transactions. And the results of our deal is that we have, our, 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 our past acquisitions is that we have overachieved on every acquisition. And I'm gonna run through a case study next. But first, as you think about where you invest, let me share briefly how we invest, how we find an apartment project. How do we pick something that we would like to uh, uh, bring to our investors? You know, first of all, we look at off-market opportunities as well as on-market opportunities. We look for strong market fundamentals. We would like to see that the, that the area is has job growth, has population growth, has a diversity of employment. You know, uh, a good example. You know, back in the 80s, Houston was, you know, a very high percentage of, of oil and gas. And you know, when the oil and gas industry hit hit the skids, you know, Houston had a lot of trouble. So we want to see a broad diversity of, of employment. Another one, Las Vegas, you know, it's high concentration of hospitality. Well, it's, it does other things now, but, you know, we'd like to see a broad range of employment base. We'd like to see path of progress type item, items, you know, perhaps it's a, you know, it's a it's a new uh, new factories coming into the area, things like that. And we also look, of course, for landlord friendly states. Um, we have found that, you know, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, evictions are necessary. And, you know, obviously, we don't like to do that. But at the same point in time, when, you know, an investor, or sorry, when a uh, when a resident is not maintaining their part of the contract, evictions are necessary. That protects our interests. And, you know, if 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 um, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to do that in New York or California because they're t typically known to be re uh, tenant friendly states. We look in locations that are in the suburbs around the, these population centers. We don't typically look downtown. Uh, we, we run a value add strategy, as I mentioned. So what does that mean? We don't do brand new properties. The, the yield is not there on a brand new property because they've been so expensive to build, especially with today's construction costs. We also don't do a heavy lift, for example, you know, maybe a property that's say 50% occupied, that is not going to work for us. Uh, if you get have trouble getting the financing, it's also very risky for the investors and it's not something we like to do. So we're not going to take that on. Um, you know, and also we don't really want to take property, buy a property that was just renovated because they just ran some of the, they squeezed some of the juice out that I would like to be able to to take on and and and, and have that opportunity to return the money to our investors through being able to run that renovation plan. Uh, we invest in B, B plus, A minus assets. We don't do the A plus plus, like I mentioned, they uh, often tends to be brand new construction, uh, constructed assets, and there's not a lot of yield in those things because they were so expensive to build. And we also don't do the C properties. We look for uh, 100 units or more. Our age that we prefer to stay in is 1990s or younger. Um, we'll consider something a little, you know, maybe in the 80s, uh, but we, we're not going to do the 70s property or certainly not anything older than that. In terms of the unit mix, um, we're okay with a 1-1, one -one, a one bedroom, one bath, uh, but I don't want to see the majority of the units be 1-1s. One they're, they're not as interesting to uh, the resident pool as, let's say, a 2-2, two, -two, two bedroom, two bath, or a three bedroom, two bath. Um, so some 1-1s one -ones are okay, but not the majority. We look for garden style or townhomes. We do not do high rise apartments. And quite honestly, everybody, you may know this, but during COVID, the uh, the high rise apartments didn't do as well as the garden style, as well as the the suburban apartments, because you know people didn't want to get a get on the elevator with somebody else that had you know might might be sick. Um, and we do uh, certainly prefer. We really would have 
hard hard pressed to buy a property with a flat roof. It's just asking for trouble down the road. So that's kind of how we pick deals. Um, you know, again, we screen out a lot of opportunities that knock on our door that we we see based upon some sort of you know violation of this criteria. Um, I didn't talk specifically about it here, but you know, generally we look in the Sun Belt. You know, so we look in. Uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, we st we're starting to look in Florida, we'll consider Tennessee, and there might be a few other places we'll go, depending upon certain, uh, you know, maybe the, the attractive cities in some uh, some other areas, but, you know, that's our kind of our bread and butter, those, those, uh, those markets. So, for you, the investor, how do you select an apartment syndication or an ap apartment offering? Well, you know, I, I certainly don't presume to to know people's uh, you know particular thought processes uh, completely, but again, here's some things to consider if you have not if you're not sure how to go about. It, here's some things to consider. We like to, you know, we like to think we we are um, you know we're, we're the guys that can help you know find out if it's something you would like to be interested in by having a conversation with us. You know, are you looking for cash flow? Are you looking for growth? Are you looking for a mix of both? I mean, there are some folks that just want to have a straight cash flow where they want to have very little risk and we have an we have a we have an offering to match that uh, there's some folks that want to have some cash flow but are, are expecting on the longer term growth by the value of the apartment complex increasing and we have an offering for that as well um, and then I would uh, suggest an important thought process is again what's your investment criteria you know certainly go back and look at our investment criteria we we, we uh, are pretty we're very rigid in that, in the fact that, you know, it's gotta be a great opportunity for us to kind of, you know, break one of our own rules. Um, and, you know, we really try to stick to our criteria. We, we, we use that as a filter. And, you know, you very well, very likely have some things in your mind that are that are the right type of criteria for how you make a decision. Um, and, and again, you know, please refer back to ours, the things we already covered, if it, if, it's, if it helps you expand how you think about things. Um, and then I think another super important point is who's the syndicator, who's the operator, who's going to run that property? Well, we feel it's important to know, like, and trust that person, you know, feel like you've got, you know, you've, you've got some knowledge about what they do. They're open and willing to have a conversation with you and they demonstrate trustworthiness. And, you know, I think a, a measure of that is certainly the track record that the operator, you know, the syndicator has. Um, and to that point, I think there's a couple of relevant, there's a relevant question there. Do they only talk about their acquisitions? You know, there are a lot of folks out there that do what we do that have bought property. But guess what? You don't know how those uh, uh, properties are going to turn out until they sell it. And that's what we call going round trip. They bought the asset and then they later sold the asset. Our our track record is is demonstrated. We are we have gone round trip on three deals. We're about to go round trip on this the fourth deal that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, and then you know again you know the proof's in the pudding. You set a plan to produce some results. Well, how did it actually turn out? Again, that's you only experience that by uh, seeing the end of the of the story by by selling the asset. Um, another dimension, another factor we think is also important is how does that operator, how's the, how's the syndicator communicate with their investors? You know, do they, you know, do they do some kind of newsletter? Uh, do they do, or do you just not hear from anybody? I've, 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 I know some folks who have been in, in a syndication, a private placement where they really just don't hear anything and that's not okay. You know, we believe that's absolutely the wrong thing. So, you know, how we communicate is we do um, a monthly newsletter let the investors know how things are going. Uh, we release our financials in terms of the, the operating statement and the rent roll on a quarterly basis. We also do a quarterly webinar where investors are invited to come uh, to a, a, a forum like this and ask some questions. And you know, then of course, obviously, managing expectations and helping the investor know when the K1s are gonna be ready. Those are the type of things we, we do. Um, one of our tools that we do that with is having an investor portal and each investor has an account on that portable portal and that's how they they do their uh, do their uh, commitment or investment documents so we use DocuSign so that everything is electronic in terms of when an investor decides they want to invest with us they go through their account they sign the documents the private placement documents through um you know through the through the DocuSign now if 
I, again, I don't, I don't recall. I have to take it offline with Corey. If it's something where, um, you know, if, if somebody decides to use their, their money that's with Advana, if, if Advana has to sign those documents for you, then that's, there's a process. We can take that offline. Uh, but the point is, is that, you know, we have an investor portal. That is how, how we communicate with investors. It's secure. That's how we distribute the K one so that you can know where they are. And, and also you can track your investment a long time. You see your returns there, you see distributions paid out. Uh, and by the way, we pay monthly distributions. Um, and you'll see that, um, you know, within the investor portal. And then the, another important point is again, who's on the operators team. You know, certainly there's an extended team of lawyers and insurance people and, and other, other folks that are all part of helping to, you know, to do the, to do the project. And obviously the most important person is the investor, but somebody specifically on our team, that's really important is the property manager. Um, you know, some firms have in-house property management. We elect to go with a third party organization. And then, you know, then my job is to manage the manager. I manage the property manager, make sure they're doing their job. And we talk to them weekly, review their reports, you know, frequently to understand where we are, how things are going. And, you know, are they executing the plan that we had intended, et cetera, things like that. And then quite honestly, again, investor relations, some, some, it's a, it's a role. Somebody's doing that role. It might be me. It could very well be that we actually particularly have hired an investor relations manager uh, that's on our team, director of director of investor relations is on our team. You know, but again, I think these are the, are the type of things that uh, I would propose are relevant for an investor to make a decision between, you know, apartment investment opportunity A and apartment investment opportunity B. Corey, any yep. questions? Uh, there are a few questions, and, and I just wanted to sure. give a little bit of insight um, as to your uh, investor portal and the side of it, how a company like Advanta would interact with the syndicators directly. So uh, mm -hmm. we are definitely able to execute documents digitally. Uh, as I referenced in my case study, we would just first need to collect our own DocuSign from the client in question, uh, marking the items as read and approved. And then our account manager team will actually go through and execute your documents digitally in the name of the retirement account and then that access portal that you allow for your investors would be something that typically we might have the login details saved to our client's profile but they ultimately would be the ones logging in and checking those things directly with park capital partners in that scenario so i just wanted to provide some insight to that, that that's how we interact and work with the syndicators and then i do have a few questions um, going back just one slide and kind of tying into this slide as well regarding the investment criteria uh, can you just give a, a quick example of the difference between the the cases of properties like you mentioned uh c plus c minus all the way up to like an a uh, is there a simple to find guide for new investors to learn you know what's the different classes and what they may be interested in investing into uh, sure, I'll uh, I can briefly describe it, and I think actually we have we may have something on our website. I, I have to I remember, but um, in the middle there, number five class. Um, so th you think of it a, 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 in a, in essentially a range of A, B, C, D, and he, in a way you could actually think about it at both as the apartment as well as the area. Um, you know, the area if it's an up and coming growing area, and it's a you know. Um, you know, nice area with, you know, high end, um, you know, retail as well as, you know, restaurants and, you know, that type of thing. That's probably going to be a B plus area, it might be an A area. Uh, in terms of the property itself, it's not really a hard and fast rule, um, but in general, you could think of it as, you know, A class tends to be something that was just built. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, you know, I don't, we don't, um, you know, buy in urban areas like just say New York City, for example, you know, a, a, there, a, you know, a hundred year old building could still be an A class building because of its location and because of the cachet that's with it, associated with it and things like that, you know, like a hundred year old bu building on Park, a, Park Avenue, that's probably going to be an A class property if as long as it's been well maintained, you know, uh, kept up and is, is providing, you know, a great product for the resident, um, you know, but again, you know, a building in a different section of New York that's, you know, not as as nice could very well be a C building that's that's a 10-year-old building because it's just not well maintained. So, but again, think about it from a suburban standpoint, you know, a brand new building, 
uh, that's built in the suburbs is probably going to be an A-class building. And the reason that that's the case, if you if you hadn't thought about it that way, is that you know building costs so much today, you really can't build a C property. You know, a C property becomes a C property because it's get, it got old and it maybe it wasn't perhaps maintained. Um, so that that kind of anything that's kind of you know in in the you know 20 years or younger maybe if it's w really well maintained in 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 a prime location that could be an A property you know a B property could very well be something that's 10 to 10 to 40 years old uh it, it's you know it's in a it's in a nice area maybe not quite the A area or or perhaps it is and it's just maybe not quite as well maintained you know the thing you uh, the, the strategy we would we would want to see is you know we we want a B property in a B area or an A area. You know, I I consider a C property in a in a A area if if there was a way to improve that property and really generate some returns for the investors. But again, that's gonna be that's gonna be a little more to the heavy lifting side of things in terms of how to um, you know generate the returns. So you know, again, loose guidelines about it. Uh, you know, a C property is definitely gonna be you know 30 40 50 years old just maybe not as well maintained maybe not as in a, a, a great area and a d property I, we don't even look at d properties you know d properties you can make money on them but there's a lot more risk on that so hope that helps a bit no that was a great explanation thank you very much so the next question is actually two questions that seem to go within each other um, and this is a question for you directly in park capital partners as a investment firm can you accept funds not in an IRA? An example, funds from a tax-free Section 1031 exchange, uh, and it seems to tie into the sale of an office building. And then the follow-up to that, does the investment as a limited partner qualify as a like-kind investment in real estate for purpose of 1031 exchange? I've only really seen 1031 exchanges personally where it's a domicile being exchanged for a domicile so uh I, i'd like to hear your input for that as well richard yeah to my understanding uh an office to an apartment would qualify as a like kind enough to be able to to to, to work under a 1031 exchange um but i will tell you this that you know 1031s i i, I fully support it um i haven't done one yet I'm, I'm trying to get to a point where i can do one myself um it's fantastic that the tax law allows for that uh, but the there is some difficulty in terms of taking an, an investment in say a, a property that uh, you know an offering that i have there's some difficulty in terms of taking 1031 money in to that deal um it gets it gets pretty hairy so um you know I, I i'm aware that some people have been able to do it we've had some conversation with our attorneys and our tax consultants about how to do it but i've got more frankly i got more homework to be able to you know to crack that code before i would be able to to do it um and again you know it's it's probably beyond the scope of this conversation to go into it but it's it can be it can be done but it's really difficult to do so uh it's certainly in uh I, i'm just speaking about it from my view from the investor's view of of you know, trying to find a way to place money, uh, do a 1031. Absolutely, I would I would hunt and figure out how to crack that code. You know, if it's if it's this kind of investment, you know, and and you're able to talk to the sponsor and figure out a way to do it, um, you know, wonderful. Now, again, I will also say from my point of view, um, it, as, as as difficult as it is, if it's say a hundred thousand dollars that somebody's trying to do a 1031 placement on, that's probably not going to be able to get done. If it's a couple million dollars, that's a different story, you know. Um, but there is also another thing called uh, a DST, Delaware Statutory Trust. That's another source of where you might be able to uh, place, you know, just say it's just say it's three hundred thousand dollars that you you can't put into a, a, an apartment deal like this. And again, I, like I said, I'd love to figure it out. It's just really hard to do. Um, but you could perhaps put that into a DST, which would therefore qualify as keeping your 1031 status rather than losing it. Uh, so there are ways to, you know, place that money with that, even if you can't put it into what you thought you might want to, like an apartment, unless you're doing your own deal or something like that. Hope that helps. I believe that does. And uh, we've had two questions come in while you're giving that answer. And then um, from there, I'll just cut those off and I'll ask them any more that come in later so we can keep your, your presentation sure. going. Uh, sure. Do you... Do you anticipate bonus depreciation in the first year? Yes. So we run what's called a cost segregation study. 
Cost segregation study allows you to reclassify the depreciation schedule for the asset. Uh, apartments depreciate over 27.5 years versus commercial buildings, which depreciate over 39 years. And we follow the tax law. The tax law actually requires you to run a cost segregation study. Now, guess what? The federal government's not going to complain if somebody doesn't do a cost segregation study, but we do execute cost segregation studies because we know it's advantageous to our investors. Um, so again, just pretend you have a $10 million building, $2 million is the value of the land. You don't depreciate land, but the other $8 million can be reclassified into, into different buckets from 27 and a half years to it's a five and I think it's a seven and a half and it might be a 15 year bucket. I can't remember if there's three or four buckets, but anyway, the point is that you've got hundred units. I said, uh, I didn't, I didn't, but hundred units, but it's hundred units. Those hundred refrigerators are not going to last 27 years. Those hundred stoves, et cetera. So you reclassify things into those other buckets and you follow the tax law that says you can get accelerated depreciation and bonus depreciation. So your year one depreciation is significantly more than it would be on a normal schedule. Uh, and that, that, the, that depreciation goes to our investors. It doesn't go to me as the GP, it goes to the investors. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. And the final question before we move on, uh, one of the participants asked, can you tell us why you don't invest in C properties that are 50% occupied? I don't invest in C properties that are 50% occupied because they're really hard to get a loan on. And it is very management intensive in terms of trying to turn that property around. Um, you know, it's, it's a really heavy lift in terms of the effort, both on the property manager on, and on, on us and on quite honestly, uh, it's, it's really risky for, I feel it's risky for the investors. Yes. You know, with greater risk, you can get re greater reward. Uh, but again, it could very well be that, you know, because it's such a, such a level of, of property, you know, I may not be able to pay any, any returns to the investors for, you know, for six months, nine months, a year. And you know, there are not a lot of investors that, again, it goes back to your risk profile, your your investor profile. If you're the kind of person who wants to, who can sit tight and not have any cash flow for a year and then just get, you know, so you get a big pop because we've gone from 50% up to 90 in, in that year because we've renovated, because we've improved. And then all of a sudden we have, you know, lots of, lots of cash to distribute. Well, great. You know, but again, not everybody likes that. And it's not uh, something that fits our model for how we like to do our deals. Perfect. Great explanation. So yeah. I will. Uh, hey, real, you... yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, just I'll go on a second. But one thing I did want to clarify, I, I mentioned that the depreciation doesn't go to me on the GP side. I invest in my our deals and I my money sits on the LP side. So I do get depreciation on as an LP investor. So I'm both an, both an LP investor, limited partner investor and the general partner. Uh, but no money goes. No, none of that depreciation goes to the GP team. It only goes to the money that sits on the LP side, including my money. Okay, I'll keep going. Skin in the game. Right, so, I like to hear that. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. okay, sure. Um, we're going to talk through a case study of this uh, property, 630 Fairview Apartments in Sim Simville, South Carolina. There's just a couple of photos of the property. Uh, and I'll keep going. Um, and I'm going to run through a bit of the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, really kind of tell you a little bit of the story, how this came to pass. In terms of the beginning, this was a property that was on the competitive open market. Um, so in terms of winning the deal, what that means is that we submitted a letter of intent, which is our offer to buy the property and our offer to enter into the intent to create a contract, a purchase and sale agreements, the actual contract, PSA. Um, so we write a letter of intent that goes through a vetting process where they down select to a certain number of, 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 of buyers that meet the, you know, the expectation for what the owner wants out of the deal. So then what happens typically in these type of acquisitions is that we go into what's called a best and final bid, where we, of course, you have to, you know, tighten up our terms and probably offer more money, things like that. Uh, and then a lot of times there's actually a down select again, where the owner may very well go into what they call buyer interviews. You know, they want to understand, they want to talk to us, understand that we know what we're doing. We've underwritten, uh, you know, in, in, in this case, uh, a tax reset that happens in South Carolina upon purchase. Uh, some localities it happens down the road, maybe on a three, four year cycle in South Carolina happens right away. So they want to know basically that we are credible. We know what we're doing in terms of our underwriting. 
and that we uh, understand what's going what's going to take to run the property once we go into the next stages, et cetera. So, uh, and then and then ultimately we we moved into a win uh, phase where we we actually won the property, and that really then kind of goes into the next step, which is the contract to close. You know, we we our our letter of intent has been approved and accepted. And yeah, you you get the you get the ability to go now negotiate the purchase and sale agreement, which is the actual contract. Uh, during that uh, process, we go back and forth between the attorneys, and obviously, uh, you know, we try to use the letter of intent to set the expectations, and then we follow up and ultimately arrive at a purchase and sale agreement, and we sign that. Um, and then we obviously, upon ha actually having a con contractual control of the property. Uh, we let our investors know about it. Hey, we we hold a webinar. We tell our investors that, hey, this is a this is an opportunity that's out there for you, available for you to inv invest in. You know, we've got our private placement memorandum documents and our subscription agreement documents that are all ready to go, et cetera. Uh, and then in this case, we we raised 5.4 million dollars for that purchase. Um, all the while, we're going through a due diligence process whereby we we look at all the documentation provided by the current owner. We actually walk every unit to inspect and note the condition of the unit in terms of anything that uh, is, is, is perhaps not in good repair. Uh, we also want to understand, you know, even if it's in good repair, we want to understand, you know, what we're dealing with, for example, the appliance ages or, you know, or, or, or what, are the, what are the toilet sizes and, you know, that kind of thing, even though it seems ridiculous, wait a minute, why do you care about how, is it a, you know, the, the toilet flush? Well, water, you know, if, if, if even if it is, if it's a situation where we're paying the water bill, we absolutely care how much water is being used. If you know that would be a one central meter for the entire property, which still is the case uh, in some places. Uh, and but if even if the resident pays the water, you know we very may very well see the need to perhaps replace toilets or things like that. Um, anyway, so we go through that. We actually look at the leases that are in place to make sure that all the paperwork's there. That the current owner their property management company has been doing their job and they have you know all the stuff that's supposed to be there and then we do a pca property condition assessment that's a a, a third party report ordered by the bank the lender um, they also do some uh, an environmental review to make sure that you know there's no you know past evidence of a dry cleaner on property or you know a gas station on property things like that that could perhaps have polluted the soil um, so ultimately, you go through the whole process, and 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 you get to a point where you you can you complete the raise, of the then you can you close the sale, and then you take over operations. Okay. Um, so at the beginning, again, we set expectations. We set expectations with our investors through our private placement memorandum, uh, through all the documentation as far as what we see for this property over time. So, and again, these are the expectations we set for this particular property. Again, 630 Fairview. Uh, we said, okay, we're anticipating that we're going to plan about a five-year hold. We see a plan for an internal rate of return over time to be about 16%. Average annual return is 18%. We saw a path to a over five-year hold of a 1.92 equity multiplier. And what that means, just in case it's not a term familiar to you guys, is that um, you know, if you invested $100,000, what could you expect at the end? when you count up your cash flow over time, as well as returning your capital, as well as you know, profits from the sale. So in that case, $100,000 would turn into $192,000. And these are all really nice solid returns. This is, you know, again, this is for a nice B asset. If it was a C asset, you might see a little higher returns, but again, that's because you've got a little more risk. Um, in terms of the specifics, we had two classes of share a, I talked about the type of investor you are, right? Earlier, you know, we have, if somebody just wants cash flow, then we have the, what's called the A share. That's a cash flow, straight cash flow. Um, it's a nine, pays a 9% preferred rate of return and they get paid before the B shares. The B shares is cash flow and upside. 7% uh, preferred rate of return. If there's any extra money, that splits 70% to the LPB shares, and then the 30% goes to the general partners. And then at the end, when the property sold, the B shares also get a share in the profits. And again, there's a waterfall that tells out how those profits are split, and uh, generally it's a 70-30 split, and then maybe there's another hurdle. And that is what we call alignment of interests, that the general partners 
when we make a lot of money for the limited partners on specifically the B shares, that's when the general partners really get to, to share in that those gains. And so it's alignment of interest. And then we planned about a, about a million dollars in CapEx on this property. Okay, so again, that's the beginning. That's kind of the plan. These are the expectations we set for the investors. Okay, but then I'm gonna shift to the middle, to the kind of the takeover. Um, when we run a property, we have three main objectives. One, protect our investor capital, the money that the investors put in. We want to make sure that's safe, secure, and 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 it gets ultimately will be paid back. You know, we have a great track record of that. And then number two, we want to make money for the investors. Why does the investor invest? They invest to make money, right? So we want to make sure we generate returns. And then number three, we want to improve the properties. We want to leave things better than when we came, when we got when we brought the property. We've had properties where you know, in, uh, a resident had, prov had provided their notice, their notice to vacate to move out. And then they stopped and said, wait a minute, I see you guys actually care and you're spending money on the property to improve it. I actually, I wanna stay. That it, We have had that conversation with uh, residents before. Again, we our goal is number three, to improve the property. So then a, 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 certainly a larger objective, of course, over the course of running the property is to increase the revenue, reduce expenses, and we spend CapEx money to improve the property, okay? Again, we're in the middle here. We're in the operational phase. So initially when we bought the property, it was at about 98% occupancy, 98% occupancy, and that was artificially high. And you go, wait a minute, why wouldn't, why is that considered high? Well. Because we, there's going to always be some natural churn, you know, people moving in, people moving out. But same point in time, if you're improving the property, you actually have to create vacancy by not renewing somebody. Or, you know, it, it happens and we don't like it. But when evictions happen, of course, we get that unit back and we probably are going to, we're going to improve that property. You know, we want low, we want low eviction rates, of course, and we get that by proper screening of of our, of our residents up front, but at the same point in time, you know, unfortunately things happen. People, you know, sometimes aren't, you know, don't, don't run their, their budgets the way maybe you and I would. Um, and, you know, they have trouble paying their bills. Uh, right now, I, I did mention that um, this is an actual result case study. So we're, we're selling the property and I'll come back to that in a second, but the, you know, we're about 95% occupancy right now. And again, that's not artificially high at 98. But the second bullet, we deliberately lowered our occupancy to about 90% to enable our renovation. You know, we have to free up units to be able to uh, to, to renovate them. And again, that's going to be through somebody being evicted, somebody moving out, and and we just take that unit where somebody you know moved out under normal circumstances, and we mark that unit for renovation. So we're deliberately taking that unit offline and not generating money to be able to renovate that. So. We literally specifically moved down to about 90% occupancy during our renovation phase so we could have units to work with. Uh, in terms of the financials, again, we're sort of talking about the operational piece, right? So, you know, we had, of course, planned to significantly increase our, our revenue. Uh, the results at sale, we've increased our revenue by about 11%. Um, you know, that is unfortunately hurt a little bit by, by bad debt, which, you know, you could probably guess was you know, are a little artificially high compared because we were coming out of COVID, right? Um, you know, there still are people that, you know, uh, were not able to, to, of course, we had a, you know, almost two years of dealing with an eviction moratorium, whether you like it or not, it was, you know, it's what we had to deal with. Um, and in doing so, what that allowed was for certain people to, you know, um, you know, perhaps milk the system. And we did have that in a few cases. Uh, but anyway, we also, specifically, you know, worked to support our residents in terms of helping them make sure they were aware of, of assistance programs. And, and again, by, by being aware of that assistance programs and, and helping our residents, we were able to, you know, achieve and collect $85,000 in assistance over the past year, you know, which again, we felt good about that because again, those residents got to stay in their homes. Um, and again, bad things happen to good people. So as long as it was a good resident that normally, you know, had a good, good performance, behavior, and all that good stuff. You know, the fact that they needed some assistance to get, you know, get caught back up because they had a, a job issue in just say, you know, just say last last October, you know, and they were able to get back on track and, and move forward. Awesome, 
great, you know, happy to renew that customer. But the person that took advantage, they were not going to be renewed. Um, in terms of operating expenses, we had planned, of course, to uh, reduce the expenses. Um, we are not there. And the reason being is that, again, we're not at year five. You know, we had, uh, you know, we had, we had specifically been spending a lot of money to improve the properties. Uh, and then the other thing also, I mentioned the tax reset, the taxes get reset on day one of, of purchase. So, you know, we're, we're working on, uh, getting those expenses, you know, reduced over time, but obviously we have to continue concentrating on that. And that's something we always focus on. Um, then at the bottom in terms of the net operating income, we had obviously planned to increase the net operating income. You know, again, that's, you know, overall revenue minus overall operating expenses equals net operating income. So um, again, it, it uh, is not quite where we wanted it to be, but again, we're, we're well poised to start seeing that net operating income take off had we not been, you know, selling the property. All right, I'm gonna go on. Corey, if you see any questions, just go ahead and jump in. Okay. Yeah, there was actually a question about the waterfall uh, breakdown on the proceeds. Um, yeah. it, so that was a few slides back, but I, I didn't want to cut you off as you're in the midst. Um, the question is, is there a waterfall 70 to 30 and then 50 50? Uh, I, I guess that's the way it's worded, um, if you can interpret that. Yes, that is the, the case. That is the general market for what we. Uh, what we see and a lot of folks that do what we do and and the, the again that circles back to the alignment of interests and what that means is that um you know when you get to the end of the sale obviously you have your sale costs that have to get paid you have to pay back the loan which you didn't now of course obviously you got to pay back the loan uh but the, but then you have uh the waterfall again the waterfall is a common term that dictates how the pro proceeds are paid out to to the investors and to the the general partners and that waterfall is disclosed up front it's indicated it's defined in the in the private placement memorandum uh that is what you sign to be part of the investment so it's all disclosed up front and again the market is generally that you know, you're going to have a 70-30 split up to a certain internal level, uh, rate of return hurdle, and then it might change to a 50-50. But the but the again, it all circles back to alignment of interests. You know, we don't cross that mark and in, to go into that next uh, level of of return unless we perform, and we will all want to make a lot of money on this, and that's why it's set up to to incent you know, the general partners to, to drive and, and, and make, make everything be super successful. And, in, and in doing so, you know, everybody, everybody wins. So that's kind of the why. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And again, just to reiterate everyone, if you have questions as Richard's going through, he's at the middle of his case study right now. So we've still got a few different slides to go through the rest of this case study. Please add your questions to the question block and I will ask them to him accordingly. Okay, perfect. I'll keep going. Um, so again, just to give you a little context, this uh, particular apartment had 120 units, and it was um, 70 classic units at the start, 30 R units, which is a goofy designation, but that's what so the that's the way that the people we bought from called a prior owner's level of renovation the R units, and then the people we bought from renovated the 37 units, and they called those D or deluxe units. Um, so the initial plan was that we were going to, of course, uh, any, when we took over, as soon as we took over, the initial plan was to, was to just turn units and we had to deliberate delay in running our renovation strategy because when we acquired, you know, COVID was still pretty, uh, pretty ugly. And, you know, there were a lot of people that were still concerned and we, we of course just wanted to play it a little conservative in terms of really going out and spending, you know, uh, um, you know, a bunch of money on a situation where, you know, we're not sure if, if uh, you know, how the, how the market was going to behave. You know, we, I, you know, I, I saw in COVID hit and, you know, everything got ugly in, in middle of March in 2020. In May, I saw signs that things were not going to be as bad as everybody feared and that the, the world was going to still carry forward. Uh, but at the same point in time, we still wanted to play cautious just as terms of just being, be, feeling like we could, you know, go spend a bunch of money on an apartment and generate, you know, uh, another couple hundred dollars in rent for that apartment. It proved to be true, but we took a very deliberate um, uh, approach that, you know, just allowed us to be nimble. Uh, so anyway, after COVID, we 
we now completed 21, uh, 20 or 21 uh, premium units. So at the very top right, you can kind of see uh, there were that's probably a classic unit, you know. And notice the upper level of cabinets above the sink, blocking the view into the other room. Um, and then the middle is uh, taken from a perspective where you're looking from the other room through the cabinet row of cabinets that were removed to provide an open up a much more spacious view and that is actually a, i guess probably what you would call a d unit still white appliances still form like a countertops still a you know a, you know fairly average uh, faucet there uh and and appliances that type of thing uh so our plan was that we actually when we took to the premium units we moved to the the finish level you see in the lower uh lower right uh, nicer cabinet doors, new door pulls, stainless steel appliances, quartz countertops, undermount sink, uh, add a microwave. You know, the microwave was in the middle picture, but not in the top picture in the classic units. And then on the right over the sink would be that row of cabinets that was, again, we removed specifically to provide more openness. Um, so that's kind of what our premium units look like. Um, give me one second. Okay, um, and then down in the, you know, uh, as we as we were moving toward the sale, you know, we deliberately, of course, stopped renovating and just really shifted back to turning units. You know, of course, you know, we, we wouldn't want to start a project that can't be finished during while the sale's going on. So we, we, you know, of course, just got it to a wrap up, but we still, of course, would turn a unit to make sure it's rent ready for the new owner, that type of thing. And there's just a couple other pictures. Uh, of the of the pool and the the new flooring that we put into uh, one of these renovated units and that's the long view looking into the kitchen that you see there on the center center bottom okay uh, in terms of some more things that we did from a capex standpoint and again we're not talking this is just the exterior stuff i'm not talking about the unit renovation but again we replaced five roofs upon takeover uh, on the residential buildings and on the clubhouse uh, we tuned up all the other roofs we in the lower in the center on the right you see that where the, the, the Tyvek um, uh, building wrap, we expanded the maintenance shop. There had been a, a car wash there that was quite honestly a, a, a giant nuisance. Um, you see there just on, it, there's a small picture of a small concrete pad there. We had a, you know, four or five foot tall uh, sh uh, vacuum cleaner for people to vacuum out their cars. Well, literally three months after we bought the property, somebody stole it. And we're like, are you kidding me? Somebody would actually come in and steal a vacuum. Well, literally that thing was like $2,000. So we're like, okay, wait a minute. We got to, we got to reassess this. And then as we, look, we thought about it more, we realized, wait a minute, we have this car wash here and it was being used uh, some by our residents, but guess what? A whole lot of other non-residents were using it. They were just literally driving on property, washing their car, wasting water. So we said, okay, this thing is a nuisance. We're going to take it out. So we expanded the maintenance shop. Um, we sealed and striped it had to repair a parking lot. You see some of the other pictures. Um, and we redid the clubhouse. We changed the flooring, made things, other other poor repairs. Again, just maintaining the property. But these are all things that, one, cost money. Two, have to be done. But at the same point in time, just the, the kind of level of care we provide on the property. Uh, in the in Just to the left of the Tyvek picture, uh, we had to actually put a playground, uh, a fence around the playground. The playground was there. Our insurance company said, listen, you got to put a fence around that. And we said, okay, yeah, let's let's make it look right. So that, that fencing tied in with the theme of the property. That's the same fencing that was around the pool, things like that. I'll keep going. All right. Now let again, you're wondering what's this what's the key to make all this work? You know, we, you know, how do you do this? You know, how do you run these operations? How do you ultimately increase the revenue, cut the expenses, drive up the net operating income? Well, here's the secret. I'm being facetious, of course, but anyway, the point is, is that we've done this before. We know how we're doing it. It, it is, uh, you know, it's 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 a lot of hard work along the way, but at the same point in time, it's worth doing because again, our goal, protect investor capital, return, provide investor returns and improve the properties. So let me move fast forward to, to coming up on the end. Um, in February of this year, we had a knock at the door. We had always resisted that knock at the door. You know, there, there are folks out there that, uh, you know, call owners all the time. 
uh, hey, is it time to sell? And our answer was always no, it's too early. We were we were still just getting going on a renovation strategy. I mentioned to you that, you know, minimally out of the 70 classic units, we'd only renovated 20. So we thought it was still too early. Um, but, you know, that's my job and that's my business partner's job's bill. That's our job is to make the best decision that benefits the investors. So we listened to the offer and it was a pretty, pretty attractive offer. So then we wound up saying, all right, let's, so we wound up entertaining multiple offers from multiple brokers and multiple buyers. In the end, we got an offer we could not refuse. The first offer was 37% above the purchase price that we bought for. We wound up accepting an offer that was 17% higher than that. And compared to the original purchase price, it was 59 and a half percent higher. Now we were supposed to close this week, but the uh, already by 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 this by today um, earlier, but the uh, the the buyer's lender uh, was moving a little slow, so they asked for an extension. So we now have moved it out about two weeks. So by by the end of May 13th, that end of that week, we'll, we will close. Um, but again, the important point here uh, is then you know we certainly hope we've. You know, I've got a, another slide or two, but I, I, we, we've really tried to, again, play out a case study for you. You know, how do, how do you as an investor think about getting involved in an apartment deal? Again, go back to the track record of the team. This is a perfect example of the track record. We have other success stories like this. This one is the, is the, uh, the biggest success story. Uh, we have gone round trip on three other deals and done very well for the investors on each one. So... What are these results that I'm alluding to? Um, I'll get there in a second. But again, I told you 59% increase over initial purchase price. Why did that sale price go, cr go crazy? Why did it go so high? Well, first of all, we bought the apartment right. Second, we invested and improved the property. Third, we increased the revenue. I mentioned the NOI is not where we want it to be, but again, we're still early in our plan. Not even, you know, not even not, nowhere close to the five year mark. Um, but again, we had set the stage for the, accel the acceleration of the net operating income. Um, we had a very, very desirable product. And, and then finally, the market went berserk. Of course, that certainly helped. But again, if we hadn't laid out the other fundamentals, a market going crazy wouldn't have helped uh, as much. You know, we certainly, we certainly set the stage and the groundwork for improvement of, of the opportunity to, to do really well. Um, so without further delay, here are the results. We purchased in August of 2020. We're closing early next month. We plan on a five-year hold. It's going to be under two years. We planned on an internal rate of return of 16, and we're going to cross 50% plus. And the reason I say plus is because the numbers aren't final. I think the numbers are actually going to be higher. I fully expect them to be higher, but again, I'm just calling out 50% plus. Our average annual return, again, 18 compared to uh, the achievement is going to be 50% plus. And the equity multiplier, again, go back to that for a second. That was a, at 1.92 equity multiplier on a five-year hold. We've achieved, we're going to more than double the money in under two years. So we're very proud of those results. Um, you know, we certainly will call out that obviously not every deal is going to do you know, perhaps as well as this, uh, but at the same point in time, you know, by going with an operator that has a proven track record and has a, um, you know, su demonstrated success as well as demonstrated trustworthiness, you know, you're going to be able to do well on your investment. Even if it came out as a 1.92, you know, that's a, that's a really respectable return, 18% average annual return or a 16% or internal rate of return over time. Those are those are really nice, strong results. Um, but again, you know, we certainly would call this this project a partic this particular project a home run, and you know, we're we're certainly pleased about that, and very excited about it. Um, you know, let me pause there for a segment. Corey, any are there any any questions? Yeah, we actually just had a question pop up. What do you sure. see as future acquisitions with interest rates rising and heavy competition? Sure, good question. Thank you. Um, Absolutely. So, um, you know, and by the way, we are under contract for a new acquisition right now. Um, 
you know, I'm not going to talk about that here. If you'd like to find out offline, please certainly reach out or, or follow up with Corey or, or reach out to me. Happy to discuss further, but obviously I wanted to, you know, use this forum to present a factual case study of, uh, of, of what, what my business partner Bill and I do here at Park Capital Partners. Uh, but to answer your question, you know, interest rates, yes, that's certainly a concern. Um, you know, interest rates, I do think of obviously are, are already starting to go up. You know, we know inflation's up. Um, you know, we know that, um, you know, competition is crazy. And, and again, think about that for a second. Just let me, let me, di let me dice on that. Um, you know, we've been doing these apartments, you know, for, for five years or our first purchase was in 18. Um, so we had a lot of hard work before we got that first purchase, but anyway, um, the market has, has, uh, you know, gotten even more competitive than it was when we were first starting in 2017. Um, what I mean by that is that when COVID hit, you know, everybody thought the world was going to end and then we realized, okay, it's not. But what happened uh, is that anybody that was buying retail space stopped. Anybody that was buying office space stopped and they needed a place to put that money. So guess what? It all poured into apartments. So that's one of the reasons why the apartment uh, apartments have gone crazy. You know, I talked about we invest in the Sunbelt. Well, guess what? The Sunbelt's where, where, where people want to be. Um, no offense to any other, other parts around the country that, you know, there's, there's beautiful aspects and components to, you know, this wonderful country we call the United States. Uh, but at the same point in time, these are the markets we look in, as I referred to earlier. And that's, these are the places with a high population growth, high job growth, um, high rent growth. And, you know, I do feel that that is going to continue. Um, you know, certainly you know, if, if you start, I'm not an economist and this isn't my opinion, but at the same point in time, you know, certainly I'm aware and I study these things to try to have a, have an informed opinion about what's going on. And, you know, the reality is that, you know, what's happening with interest rates for home acquisition? Well, guess what? Interest rates have gone up. That makes home, buying a home less affordable. Housing prices were already going crazy and we already were seeing signs over the past 10 years, probably, okay, go back to 08, 09, housing crisis. You know, we the, the percentage of home ownership in America has declined uh, significantly for a, a lot of reasons, you know, and some of that is that people, you know, whether, whether you're, whether you're a, a young person that maybe wants to be nimble and be able to change cities for a new job opportunity without having to sell a house, that's certainly one dimension, you know, Folks that perhaps are maybe in, you know, near retirement age realize that, wait a minute, why do they need a, a 4,000 square foot house? They could be as happy in, in, in a 1,000 square foot apartment and not have to take care of it. You know, there are people that have made those decisions. So I, the point is, is that I think the, the, the fundamentals of the market, the economy, the interest rates are going to continue you know, stressing and making it harder for people to buy homes. And what does that mean? Where are they going to live? Apartments. So we do feel like the apartment market is continue in a very strong path. Um, the apartment we're buying is in is in the same market that this one is in. And from uh, doing my research, uh, we uh, we we have a, 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 a there's a there's a source called CoStar out there. Then CoStar basically they uh, do market analysis and 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 uh, of of the of the overall metropolitan statistical area, as well as the submarket. They look at construction, rent, sales, uh, things like that. And they're predicting that the rents and just the, this particular area I'm talking about right now, the rents are gonna go from eight to 12% annually every year for the next four or five years. Well, you know, so even though we're facing inflation, even though interest rates are going up, you know, that's the great thing about apartments they continue to increase in terms of the, 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 the you know, your, your fees, your, your, your rents go up with it, with inflation. Now, again, you know, somebody signs a lease today and, you know, I can't change their price for until the next year, but at the same point in time for the, the lease that's going to be available next month, I'm going to move my price up because inflation has gone up. So I hope that answers the question, but again, the point is, is that, you know, this is why we love apartment buildings because they, they're safe physical assets that you can touch and they are, you know, they adjust for inflation uh, and, and in terms of the rents that you, they generate. And 
you know, we feel feel very bullish about the apartment market. And again, not just not just where we look in the, in the rest of the country. I think generally the apartment markets are going to be very strong in the rest of the country. I mean, again, put it this way: we all just came through the the thing that nobody in a in a million years could have ever expected. Did anybody ever foresee a black swan event like COVID, like a world pandemic, affecting everybody in the world? Absolutely not. Nobody ever predicted something like that. Well, guess what? We survived. And we bought this property during COVID and it's been an absolute home run. So of our, on our new acquisition, again, we're, we're, we're exercising restraint in terms of our exuberance. We're not planning on those 8 to 12% rent increases. We're planning on a 5% rent increase. But the point is, is that I still believe it's, a, it's an excellent place to put your money and to invest. And that's why we do it. And that's obviously why you guys are here trying to figure out how to perhaps, you know, leverage your self-directed IRA, solo 401k money in and generate returns with apartments. Corey, did I answer it? Yep, that answered the question. Um, if you wanna, yep, uh, there we go. I was gonna say, if you wanna flip that slide, I knew your contact information was next. So everyone that has heard Richard's awesome, explanations here and insight into how he finds deals and and sorts deals and how a deal actually works out with park capital partners please feel free to reach out if you want to know any more information about his other educational avenues his podcast or that upcoming deal he's referenced uh his contact information's here along with his partner bill and their investment manager or investment relations manager frank uh, i've dealt with all of them they're great people they're really nice and easy to work with and again the education that these gentlemen provide is is really unparalleled in this space so i, I greatly appreciate you uh stepping in and, and doing this webinar with me again i know we did one last year and i very much look forward to having you on again in the future richard thank you so much for your time any final words for you as well well it's been my pleasure being here uh certainly uh again i I'd welcome anybody to reach out please happy to discuss happy to you know talk to you about your interests and needs and things like that what how what type of investor you are how you what what you're looking for um again proven track record is super important um bill and i have the proven track record um you know we you know we've gone through some ugly times with with covid and we've survived and we've prospered so certainly um you know again leveraging your retirement money in an investment like this is a, a, an incredible opportunity and, and i'm so glad we have companies like Advanta that, that do this and allow you know enable you to use your money versus just having it be in the stock market um you know, certainly pleased to be here. You know, appreciate your time. Reach out. Happy to chat further and and uh, discuss what's what's in what uh, you know what what your interests are and things like that. And uh, you know, love to chat with you. Please reach out. Thank you, Corey. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everyone participating or watching this recording. We will see you next time. Have a great day.